uh, we're thrilled to have our own uh, professor of historical theology in the afternoon who needs really no introduction. I think it would be important to say, though, that ecclesiology has been the real life interest, a heartfelt uh, interest of Ephraim Radner's, probably going back to the time of his missionary work in Burundi, uh, which was so formative to him, uh, and raised a lot of uh, deeply existential questions about the character of the church in a place where Adventists and Catholics and others so brutally treated one another. And I think has, um, has doubtless uh, been a catalyst for a lot of Ephraim's reflections uh, on ecclesiology, uh, which uh, of course go back also as well into his training with George Lindbeck at Yale, where he wrote his dissertation on Jansenism. Uh, and uh, has, has those, those themes have remained important ones for Professor Radner right along and have taken him uh, always, uh, also into the travails and neuralgias of the Anglican Communion, uh, many of whom uh, are, are part of that body here at Wycliffe College. So this is a, uh, I, I, by the way, I, I think we're all thrilled with the turnout. Uh, you know, it's like the, you, you work hard to get the right things, and then you say, well, let's just do this, and that one turns out to be the one that, that uh, uh, really has drawn a really nice uh, crowd. We welcome our guests here from Tyndale College and others. So uh, this uh, is an, a brilliant opportunity. We've had talks from Philip Turner on Ephesians and Ecclesiology, from Professor Mangina on the True Vine in John's Gospel, and now perhaps widening the lens a bit uh, in, in a different way. We stay with our theme on ecclesiology. Uh, and uh, so the, the, uh, I'll let Professor Radner tell you his title. And uh, without further ado, let's welcome him warmly. Ecclesial futurology, uh, that is the question of can we know the future of the church? How do we know? What do we know about the future of the church? Uh, and given the context of this uh, uh, colloquium, what is the place of scripture in doing ecclesial futurology, figuring out the future of the church? Some of you may recognize uh, uh, that a kernel of this paper I already uh, presented in a way at a conference last, uh, or a panel or whatever you want to call it, last month at Biola University called The Future of the Church. Uh, but it's much expanded and there's other emphases, uh, but that's just to let you know that I was pressed to think about this precisely in a context of invitation with other uh, ecclesiologists from other traditions, Catholic, Pentecostal, uh, and so on, uh, who came to that Biola gathering, which was live streamed and so on. I was pressed to think about this through this sort of uh, gathering of what were meant to be different, and they were, different views from different, and that's the question, from what? From different parts of the church, from different churches, from, and that's sort of what I'm gonna start with. So, the quote under which I place this talk comes from Yogi Berra of recent memory. Yogi Berra was, of course, the great, uh, and Yankees, I like the Yankees, but I, I do root for the Blue Jays, just so you understand that. But uh, Yogi Berra was the great Yankees uh, catcher known for his unusual sayings, he just died, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago, a month ago. Uh, anyway, this is the saying under the rubric un, uh, under which I place the talk. The future ain't what it used to be. Now, you can try to think that one out, and um, uh, I will try to do that in my own way. Uh, because making this my motto, as it were, suggests that I will be trying to subvert common ways of talking about the church's future. And that's true. I'm going to be trying to do that. But I may also end up hinting that Bera is wrong in a, a way, at least with regard to the church's life, because perhaps the church's future is exactly what the church has always been and always will be. So we will talk about that. So how am I going to talk about the future of the church? I will not be talking about it on the basis of personal or experiential knowledge, which would be actually a far more interesting way to talk about it for people to listen to. But in fact, such knowledge is way too selective and limited to be of any use in talking about the future. Um, I could also appeal, and this would be a more common way of talking about the church's future, to social trends and the like. 
And of course, these are very important as well. We can learn from them. We can learn about the past, especially, and about the nature of God's providence in the past with respect to the church by looking at trends, uh, which, of course, trends are based on looking at the past, not the future. That's the whole point. You judge the future on the basis of something you've already laid out from the past. Um, but when it comes to the future, most major predictions about the church, as far as I can tell, made by very learned, thoughtful people uh, from the 14th century on, you know, great millennial fervor uh, and insistence on the fall of the papacy and so on. That's what people were predicting then. To modernity's consistent misreadings of the shape of Christian global expansion and decline, uh, people have made all kinds of predictions uh, as recently as five or ten years ago about what's happening in China, or what would happen in Africa, what wouldn't happen in the West, and so on. They've all been totally false, all of them. When we look at such predictions, we learn rather about current mindsets of religious projection. We do not learn about the truth when it comes to social trends. So I'm not going to be looking at any of that. And what follows instead, I'm going to eschew both personal and social claims about the future of the church and argue instead that the future of the church is solely, exclusively, uniquely given in scriptural terms. I will first talk about the difficulty uh, of linguistic reference when we speak of the church and suggest that the proper referent of the church is primarily figural, which I will explain. That's my first section. Section two, I will engage this figural referencing of the church in terms of the constraints that scriptural literalism, as I will call it, puts on our discussion of the church's temporal form. In the third part, I will provide a general positive outline of what the future of the figural church must be, which I will describe in purificatory terms. And finally, I will do what I said I shouldn't. I will imagine what this might actually look like as time goes on. But of course, it will be without any value. That does, however, have something to do with the present. So that's partly why we even think about the future, of course. So let's start. Uh, the problem of talking about the church, given the problem of historical reference. Now, one thing we can say about the church and her future is that they are a matter of history, at the least. There is a tomorrow to the church. And since we are talking about the church, that tomorrow touches on some kind of identity that somehow lasts through time. The church has a tomorrow. That means there is a church that has an identity. The church is at least historical in a normal sense. But having said that, we open up a whole can of worms. For the historical church, precisely because a historical church is shaped by temporal realities, is both a moral and a conceptual problem. First of all, the historical church, as a referent, is a moral problem. And I'm not going to deal with that. Chris, Chris. Uh, alluded to the fact I've written a lot about this, um, but I'll indicate what the moral problem is. For example, who could possibly want to be a member of the Roman Catholic Church in Rwanda today? This is a purely historical issue, so posed. Or what about a Jew converting to Christianity in 1950s Germany, whether a Lutheran, a Catholic, whatever? Who, why would any Jew ever do that? You see, here the experience of church in historical terms is repugnant. So if the church is at least historical, then the church is at least properly evaluated according to her history, just like any other moral evaluation of historical entities like the Spanish Inquisition or the Ku Klux Klan or what have you. In fact, though, this historical moral repugnance has been contradicted. And from my point of view, that's a good thing. It has been contradicted. There are Rwandan Roman Catholics. There were converted Jews in the 1950s. So, you see, the moral problem of the historical church is overcome somehow by a history transcending reality that we ascribe to the church. The church is more, we say, than these historical realities according to which we evaluate things morally as we normally ought to do. 
what, we can call it grace that there's this thing, but it also indicates, once you say that the church is tra historically transcendent in some fashion, once you say that, this indicates that the referent of the church escapes the identities given to it simply in time. Now, most of us understand this. I'm not saying anything that's unusual here. We understand this at least intuitively. However, this history transcending element of the church represents the historical church's conceptual problem. There's the moral problem, but now if you try to deal with that, you face a conceptual problem. How do we affect a transcending referral to the term church? How have an identity granted to a historical entity that somehow escapes that uh, identity's historical contours, its deeds, its confusions, its sins? Now Augustine, as we all know, I think, dealt with this, this conceptual problem in a classic way. Uh, it's, it's far more complex than what I'm saying, but basically there are two cities, he said, moving through time. There's the city of God, the city of the world. They're all mixed together in the one visible church, later to be sifted and revealed in her truth and purity. We can give names to the historical conditions of the church in this light. There's the church on earth, for instance which is the mixed up church of the two cities, but that in her deep purity presses ahead, churning through time. Then there's the church in heaven, who when the mixed up churning has ceased in the future, we would say usually, now in some fashion, is revealed in her true colors. The problem of course is that this is not a terribly logically consistent solution. Later theologians, I think it's the right one by the way, but it's not logically consistent. Later theologians adopted the notion, for instance, of the church militant, which is in a sense not historically the same thing as the church triumphant in heaven, whatever. They have two different constitutions. Their members are not identical. It's important to understand that. Uh, but the two churches are also the same, they insisted. You could say, well, isn't this just analogous to what a human person is, human identity? The individual person changes over time, experiences this and that, much of what is just plain bad, perhaps, uh, some of which is simply temporally limited and sloughed off, so that at the end, we might say, and in the future, that individual person who stands before God may be very different in makeup as the person who stood before, say, the civil authorities or the bishop or her family at age 40. Yet we say it is the same person, nonetheless. But somehow now, in the future, in heaven, before God, with, with, with the chaff of her soul sloughed off. Now whether this is a good analogy or not to the notion of a mixed church, that notion of a mixed church, a church in via, a church on the way through time, um, which is somehow different from the final church in some fashion, yet still continuous with it, this has all always been a central Christian claim, at least in the West. But it's a claim, as I'm indicating, with many difficulties for historical ecclesiology. What kind of speech and reference are we engaging when we talk about the church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church? What is that exactly? Can we see it? Can we point to it? Catholics and Protestants, again, as I think we all know, applied Augustine's framework differently in ecclesiological terms, although they each had a general similarity of outcome. Protestants ended up searching for the faithful people, the elect, the righteous, those like them, by prying among the weeds of the mixed up body to find something good that even if it wasn't everything they could at least put in the basket of the true, the universal collection of all good Christians who would be revealed at the end of time. Catholics, on the other hand, sought for ways to assert a continuous and integral institution uh, through various means plugging dikes of counter evidence with every incoming tide so that by the end of time the institution would still be standing as all creation could finally recognize it to be the one true church it always was. My point here is not to judge either, either sort of uh, practice, but both attempts, uh, I would say, are inherently unstable in, historical, in a historical sense. Uh, to look at the church in both the Protestant and Catholic ways through this Augustinian frame 
demands constant work. You're always readjusting, recalibrating, uh, moving from this to that as you're trying to either, either find the right people who are part of this mixed up church or trying to sort of redefine and remake uh, and mold the elements of the institutional church to keep it integral. Um, and, and as we do this, um, and you see Augustine's, Augustine's framework is focused on churning about in time as we do this. It's not this kind of, it's not floating. Nothing is floating anywhere. You're the church. The church is just going through this temporal reality and its truth is found somehow. Whether it's defined within it, it's found somehow by, by this churning about. Um, as we do this, though, the question of the church's referent is obviously both contested and also sensibly ambiguous. It can change, even in a single person's experience. So, for instance, a person could say, I was convinced yesterday that the church was this or that, but I converted, uh, and I changed my mind. Today, I think the church is that or this. You know, so people change their minds about what the referent of the word church is precisely in this historical continuum. One of the odd aspects of ecclesiology is that it is talking about something Christians themselves cannot commonly refer to, in the sense that Christians refer to quite different things in an often contradictory way when they use the term church. Not only connotatively, what does the term mean, but denotatively, where is this thing we are talking about? Christians don't agree. Thus, Christians neither agree on what church means, nor can they commonly recognize it or point to it when they see it. In general, ecclesiology deals with the church, capitalized C, not a church, lowercase c. That ecclesiology is about this big capital C. But since these are not agreed upon distinctions, the distinction between capitalized church and lowercase church, uh, and you know, different churches and secular style guides for magazines and uh, universities, Catholic University, Brigham Young, and so on, they all tell you how you're supposed to do this. When are you supposed to use the capital C? When are you allowed to use the lowercase c? And they're all different. There's no such thing as a common ecclesiology because we don't even agree on what church denotes. And we have to recognize how odd all this is with respect to many other common forms of speech. So for instance, if we call something a school, we are generally agreed as to fact that this or that is a school. Now we might say this is a really bad school, but we'd still say it was a school. Uh, there are reasons we can say it civilly and so on and so forth. Uh, and in this way, uh, uh, the church isn't like that at all. We can't point to something and agree what it is. A good church, bad church, but, but it is a church. No, we're not even church of church. That's not a church, somebody says. That's something else. Um, in a way, the category church, or the word church, is closer to categories like the good, or love, or justice, which people sort of understand, but in fact, argue about fundamentally. Friends and voting blocks divide, for instance, over what justice might be. And of course, civil law courts preside over their definition and do so over and over again and in different countries in different ways. Is that what the church is like? Or the church is also not like a referent such as the good and the beautiful because the church is not a quality linguistically. It is a thing. It involves actual people. So actual people are in the church, they're not just churchy or ecclesial. Church then is a very odd linguistic term. I just want to stress that. It's a very odd term. Theologians and Christians should engage this sui generis character of the word very carefully, I would suggest. Now I'm not going to solve this question of language. But I will suggest now that the problem, the ambiguity, is largely the result of the fact that the church is a scriptural figure, first of all. It is a word of God, 
rather than a created entity, first of all. That is to say, the church is properly spoken of in the same way as in Scripture we speak of Jacob or David in the Psalms or the prophets and later by Jesus. So, for instance, just to take one of many, many possible places, the prophet Jeremiah can write, this is from chapter 30, uh, about a day that is coming. And he writes this, It is a time of distress for Jacob, yet he shall be saved out of it. And he goes on to the promise of God, that God will, quote, break the yoke from off their neck. They shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up for them, unquote. Now, in this just little exemplary text taken at random almost, Jacob is both a man and a nation, as well as a promised kingdom. David is a man and a king, but he's also a promised lord who chronologically both precedes and follows his own human name. The reference, though, and this is the point, these are just not uh, linguistic tropes, the reference, furthermore, isn't just simply polyvalent, a Jacob or David, that is one word with various reference. Rather, Jacob and David, within the scriptural context, mean many things because they each have an underlying referent that actively orders all these many things in a singular fashion. That is to say, David and Jacob are divinely spoken words. They are divine words that in some primary fashion bring into being and shape what will become their multiple historical reference. And we call these kinds of words figures, scriptural figures. And hence, in their scriptural location, we call them specifically divine figures. Now, in this sense, the church as a figure is a divine reality. It's a divine reality, first of all. Second, is it, a, it is a reality we term scriptural in that its ontological status is given in its scriptural annunciation that is logically prior to temporal creation, its entity in time. Finally, calling the church a figure, in doing so we mean that its created contours emerge precisely as our creaturely actions and speech temporally find their conformance with the ecclesial figure itself. That's complicated, but here's the definition. This is what a figural scripture is, a scriptural figure is. A scriptural figure is the divine shape, biblically described, of creaturely coming to be in time according to God's will. I'll repeat that. A scriptural figure is the divine shape, biblically described, of creaturely coming to be in time according to God's will. Hence, the church is a complex phenomenon. And as a primary scriptural figure, the church is rooted in the most fundamental purposes of God for the world, even as the world itself is not yet clearly revealed in its divine purpose. Now, I'm not going to go a whole lot into this, but note that if this is true, or if one buys into this way of talking about the Bible speaking in figures, which is another way of simply saying that the Bible is God's word. The point here is that to talk about the future of the church is precisely to talk about the figure of church in history. In scripture, excuse me. Scripture. Scripture exposits the church. And from our side, as temporal creatures, all particular reference we understand by church in our own times, our experience, flow from this scriptural exposition as we engage it. We cannot understand what we mean by church until first we have followed through somehow uh, to engage the scriptural figure that is the church primarily. One might speak experientially or sociologically or politically as I have mentioned but dismissed with respect to the church. Uh, this would be useful only to the degree that what one noted sociologically and so on found its place in a scriptural figural discussion. But as uh, someone has written, John Bauerschmidt, a, a bishop in the Episcopal Church who wrote something actually not, not, not highly elaborated online recently, but I thought it was a, a good way to put it, 
A providential reading of God's work is precisely about what cannot be seen with one's own rational eyes. That is, a providential claim about the world or about God is that God is at work despite appearances. That's what we mean when we talk about God's providence. The post-Holocaust Jew who becomes a Christian within something called the Christian Church is trusting in a providential God, not in the God of appearances. See, that's how we are able, somehow, to transcend the moral calculus we are otherwise forced to engage when we simply look at the church uh, in historical terms, temporal terms. But on the other hand, a providential God is not a God we simply make up. I can't see it, it'll be whatever I want. It is a God who through the order of his works are, may not be manifest, yet communicates that order to the faithful according to the signs of faith, that is to say the scriptures. What we know about God in the scriptures provides us with the figures of God's ordering of the world. My conclusion to this first section is this. To speak of the future of the church, even of our ultimate future, is to speak of the history of the church according to her providential scriptural forms. It's the only way we can get at it. This engages the Augustinian paradigm I mentioned in a special way. The history of the church, including her future, is explained in its confusion, as it were, by engaging the way that the church's scriptural figures are laid out. As we face, for instance, specific issues that take up a lot of time in the newspapers and journals, and maybe some of our own research, like the decline and disease of mainline Christian churches in North America, or the expansion as well as corruption of Pentecostalism outside the West, or the explosive tensions and implosion of vocations within Catholicism, we will have all kinds of practical questions that are quite legitimate. My point, though, is that these facts, questions, and decisions have value theologically only insofar as their details are figurally tethered. Any analytic, any strategic concern that does not order itself by the figures of scripture is ecclesiologically useless. There is no point in talking about the decline of, say, Anglicanism in Canada unless it is figurally exposed. So, move to my second section. How do we engage such figural tethering? Here I come to the second section, which I will simply call the literalist constraint on our ecclesiological reflections. Figural ecclesiology depends on a literalist reading of the Bible. Figures are not ideas. They're not platonic forms. They are referring terms. And it's important to understand this. There is no figure of Jacob or David, for instance, unless the very word Jacob or David has some kind of logically presumptive scriptural ballast as a reference, which refers to something. Now, I know literalism has a bad name in academic theology and biblical study, although that only goes back to the 19th century, and only then. You should remember that. Um, but we should understand that all Christian readings of the Bible until the late 19th century mostly were literalist in the sense that they presumed the scripture as God's word was logically bound to its words. There was an inherent connection between calling it God's word and the fact that the words of scripture were bound up with that somehow. Even those who rejected the scripture generally did so on the basis of its literal character. Now, this is all rather obvious. More deeply, though, the literalist point was simply that these words of Scripture, however we view their editorial coming to be, are given to us as a gift from God. They're God's words first, and their significance, whatever it is, is bound up with this divine givenness. Now, I'm not talking about the mechanism of how this happens. How does, God's, how does God give us words? That's a whole other question. And it's probably not solvable uh, in any case. Well, I know it's not. Um, but there, and there's a lot left unresolved. I understand that. But what, conf what confuses us today is that literalism is often viewed as fundamentalist in the sense that 
the words of Scripture give rise to specific doctrines that then become immovable claims regarding God's will. That's fundamentalism of the early 20th century kind, and it's quite specific in what it's talking about. But it's one, only one, and a very constricted uh, uh, literalist approach. There are many others. I'm not going to talk about that except to say that basic literalism simply insists that doctrinal propositions are not first-order references of Scripture. They are second-order human constructions of varying degrees of usefulness and always corrigible. Rather, scriptural words, which as Jesus said, cannot be broken, or as Isaiah and Peter and Luke say, endure forever, uh, that's the basis upon which we talk about the literalistic uh, uh, approach to scripture. It's a fundamental Jewish notion. For instance, the notion of the pre-existent Torah, but it's also a Christian one too. Uh, there is, to give but one example of a theologian, our uh, uh, college's namesake, John Wycliffe, whose basic point, quite beyond his culture-bound Platonism, was that every word of scripture stands ontologically prior to human history. History follows the words of scripture, not the other way around. How that happens isn't important. <laughs> it isn't. Uh, it's the case that is crucial. Now we can identify a few fundamental presupp presuppositions to this basic point, which I think are important to note. Uh, this isn't just simply a know-nothing approach to the Bible. Um, and I, I, I elaborate this quite a bit historically uh, in a book that should soon come out. Because this is a way that, 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 that Christians have dealt with this for uh, almost two millennia. Uh, but I'll state them simply here. Presuppositions to this kind of biblical literalism. First, it's a presupposition, is God's creative omnipotence and omnipotent purpose. And the second, there is the utter subordination as a result of temporal experience to these divine purposes. Thus, God creates everything that we experience, and that includes time, whatever it is. And secondly, this is ordered according to God's purposes. These are not intellectually primitive notions, but are theologically and philosophically substantive. And in this, I challenge the crude historia, uh, historicism of some contemporary uh, academics who dismiss figural reading. Uh, it's not uh, 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 crude. <laughs> a highly sophisticated uh, philosophical and religious approach. It doesn't have to be. It can be unconscious. It doesn't have to be conscious. But uh, it underlies much. Virtually all Christian theologians believe this, as I said, for almost two millennia. And they read the scriptures accordingly until recently. God is omnipotent and he orders all things, including time, according to his creative purposes. Now with respect to temporality in particular, and when we talk about history in the future, of course this involves temporality. Experience is the key term here. What we experience as past, present, and future are not absolute realities. They are relative, cognitive, and emotional realities. They are malleably adjustive to that which we are given by God. They're the way we sort out the givenness of God as creator to us as creatures. Now since the primary shape of what we are given by God, the givenness of the world, is ordered scripturally, we rightly say that history as it is experienced is nothing but our various creaturely responses to scripture and ultimately responses that cohere with scripture and conform to it as it were. To put it another way, there is no past, present, and future except insofar as our experience conforms to or is being conformed to scripture. That is the classical figuralist presupposition which if rejected renders the Christian faith a subset of evolutionary hence chaotic cognitive gropings of social groups, unhelpfully labeled religious. So, what I'm saying is ev everything we're doing right now, <laughs> sitting here, you're writing, you're listening, you're dozing, I don't know what it is. Um, this experience that we call something a now experience, and that experience five minutes ago, that past experience, etc., uh, this is all us. 
adjusting to what God has given us, which is scripturally ordered in a primary divine sense. You may not realize how. That's the beauty of our calling as creatures, to, to, to enter into the unveiling of this marvelous divine purpose, which is contained somehow within the scriptures. Now back to ecclesiology. Within this traditional figural outlook that ties experienced temporality to divine scriptural forms, therefore, what do we do with terms like Protestant and Catholic, let alone Anglican, Presbyterian, Nazarene, Methodist, Pentecostal, Baptist? These are epiphenomenal nomenclatures. They are the names we have given to experiences of adjusting to what God has given us, which is actually more fundamentally figurally located. They mark the names of things that we experience in some fashion. But what exactly? Their pastness, their presentness, or their futureness is determined by how these reference, Anglicanism, whatever, finally line up with their prior scriptural figures. Is there a future to Anglicanism or to Adventism? Only insofar as what we call Anglican or Adventist is referred to by the figures of Scripture. Which ones? Well, see, that's the, that's, that's, that's the challenge. Edom? <laughs> Could be. Anglicanism is tethered to the figure of Edom. Or Israel? Lion or lamb? Ephesus? Or Laodicea? You follow these out, you see, and the future is exposed as for what, in fact, it is. Now, I've emphasized that the term church is of uncertain stability of reference. In general, within scripture, church, as ecclesia, refers to a single congregation, so it appears. It was a contentious point, I know, uh, and we know, underlined by William Tyndale in his first English translation of the New Testament in 1525, when he insisted on using this term congregation to translate the, or most of the, New Testament uses of the Greek ecclesia. Only occasionally does ecclesia seem to mean more than such a congregation. So, of course, Matthew 16, 18, on this rock I build my church. That'd be odd, as many people said to Tyndall, to think that on this rock I build my congregation. It might work, I don't know. Or Ephesians 1, Christ as head over all things to the church. To the congregation? I don't know. Or Colossians 1.24, suffering for Christ's body, which is the church. Now we can debate, and theologians have debated, and translators and biblical scholars have debated on how best to refer the referent of this ecclesia in these places. Capital C, little c, and so on. But in any case, the future aspect of the church is only therefore somewhat indicated by the term ecclesia in the Bible itself. You see, that's something you learn. I want to figure out what the future of the church is. Actually, it turns out scripture doesn't quite get clear about what ecclesia refers to. So how do I know what his future is? So with respect to the topic of ecclesiology then, when it comes to Anglican, Presbyterian, Nazarene, Catholic, etc., we can, as the style guides tell us, refer in lowercase to this or that church. But we cannot be sure if and how these might have any engagement with the shape of the church's ultimate form as a scriptural figure. They may be part of the church's chaff-like existence. Is the Nazarene church part of the chaff? To be sloughed off. They may be transformed in the years of ecclesial living. They may form aspects of the providential pressures, experiences, we could say, that mark the church's passage through history. But these lowercase churches do not have primary scriptural significance. Their names don't appear in scripture. There is no Anglican church in scripture, sorry. And hence, they do not directly represent the objects of divine reference, except as they carry figural weight. And determining that ahead of time is a matter of human interpretive exercise of the most inconclusive kind. To speak of the future of the church then requires us to engage figures for the church that clearly move into such a figural future or clearly express it. That is to say, where in scripture does the term church become swept up into a figure that has futurological depth or breadth? The end of time type of thing. 
The old catalog of images of the church, flock, nation, family, and so on, might be useful here. But we're talking about figures, the divine words that make us who we are, not imaginative construal. So images of the church isn't the right way to think about it. What are those theologoi, words of God, that take us to our ends as we engage our lives as members of our churches? And I'm only going to suggest one such figure, and that is the Bride of Christ, which I would argue is designed precisely to indicate and frame, if you will, the consummating character of history. The Bride of Christ is a futurological ecclesial figure. Now, this is not the place to assert any, uh, to do anything other than assert this argument. But if it's plausible, it indicates that to speak of the church in the future is to speak of individual churches that become the church's bride, presented to Christ. That's the figure given in Ephesians 5, as we know. And it is given enormous profile at the end of the book of Revelation, the last New Testament writing that describes itself in its opening verse as an apocalypsis or unveiling of things that will shortly come to pass. At the close of the book of Revelation, which is the close of the Bible, the churches that open the book, you know, Ephesus, Pergamon, Laodicea, and so on, disappear from reference. And they're not talked about. There are no more words for these churches. And instead, there is the bride. That is the word that appears at the end. Paul's bride in Ephesians 5, presumably as well, who is given in marriage to the Lamb. And this bride is finally explicitly identified with the new Jerusalem, who comes down from heaven with its gates, towers, gold and jasper, a kind of relational temple in its own right in which God tabernacles. Obviously, there's an enormous amount to say about these figures. But my interest here has to do only with the temporal dimension of the church so described. So let me end this section on the literalist constraint upon our speech regarding the future of the church by summarizing it this way. There are churches, lowercase c, plural, whatever they are. And they become, or some of them do, or are shown to be the capitalized church as the church becomes the bride presented to Christ who takes her to and as himself. So, my third section, and the last two are quite a bit shorter, there thus is a futurological substance to the figural vision of the church. And I'll provide a brief outline. The notion of the church's bride has a long history in the tradition. The figure of the church's bride is given in scripture and located in a range of texts from Genesis to the Psalms to Song of Songs and the prophets and so on, as well as in some New Testament writings besides Revelation and Ephesians. It was identified and deployed in the earliest church and was later applied to a range of Catholic, ecclesiological, sacramental, and mariological interests. Fascinating and very rich history. The church as Christ's bride, though, remember, was also a central theme for Luther, as it was for Calvin. And it became important in pietistic circles, including reform ones. Jonathan Edwards focused on this figure, among many others. And Anglicans also took it up as well here and there, and so did, interestingly enough, Baptists in the 17th and 18th century. Finally, in the 20th century, it has become popular again in evangelical circles in the most popular level of discourse. But Protestants have tended to be confused about the temporal aspects of nuptial ecclesiology. Is the bride out of time? Or, as Calvin seems to indicate, is she changing in some fashion through time? I tend to think is the case. Catholics, on the other hand, tend to be clear about the historical stability of the referent. The church's bride uh, is always pure in a temporal way, as one of the great writers on this, Anscar Lonier, insisted. Whatever be the sins of her members, the brideness of the church is whiteness, he said. With respect to a figural ecclesiology, I think it fair to say by contrast that the history of the church is the history not of stability, but of transformation. The transformation of the churches, or some of them, into the bride. Any discussion of the future of X with respect to this, where X is this or that Anglican identity or Pentecostal entity, etc., is a discussion of how X becomes changed into the bride. 
Our key text is Ephesians 5, 27. That he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and that she might be holy and without blemish. And there are, of course, many other texts. But the point is that whatever an Anglican or Methodist church may now be, its future is to be the church who is presented as the pure bride. This we can say. The Old Testament examples of this figure in Isaiah, for instance, all speak of Israel being changed somehow and becoming righteous in a new way as she becomes the bride of God, moving from forsakenness, for example, to divine possession. And I think it's the alter alteration that is important to emphasize here. The churches, as given in the early chapters of Revelation, are transformed as they become the spotless bride at the end of the book, and in some sense at the end of time, whatever that means. Now, I can only indicate here some of the claims this way of understanding our ecclesial future implies. First, it has to do with what we call the church capitalized. This may, in fact, not be a historical entity in any way that we can identify. The church may rather be a matter of contested becoming. What will be is not what is, and, what, and we are not often sure of how this is going to happen. Now that fact need not negate identity of some kind across change. I'm not saying there isn't a church, capital C. I'm just saying that historically, it may be the case we cannot identify the church, capital C. It could be the case, however, that here is a historically denoted church, the Anglican Church of Australia or Ghana or what have you, that begins in, say, sin and ends in purity, and it's the same church. That's possible. It's the same entity in the same way that a person who is a sinner and is baptized and becomes purified at the end of time is still the same person. The problem with this analogy is simply that churches aren't persons. They're many people. Perhaps we should call them societies, which was a, a, a favorite way as Bellarmine and so on talked of, like the Republic of Venice, as he put it. But societies are also strange things. They, they last as their members die and are replaced. And the fact is the Venice of today is not the same as the Venice at all, denoted by Bellarmine in the 16th century, uh, except in the most metaphorical of ways, which is the case with most nations. So I'm not denying that there is such a thing as a capital church. It is figured in the New Testament quite explicitly, so there must be one. What I am simply saying is that we do not know what, and not only where, it is. And yet, nonetheless, this is the figural import of there being a church at all. We are somehow bound to this entity whose character we somehow ignore as we churn through time. And this we know well. We, we, we sing hymns, the church's one foundation. Put forth, O God, thy spirit's might, and bid thy church increase, and so on. But it's a, it's a, it's a paradox <laughs> that we can speak about something we do not know and be certain we are part of it or engaged with it in some fashion. But it's not a paradox with which uh, we know nothing about, and which is foreign to us. Um, it's a bit like being a part of the universe. We know nothing about the universe. And if we do, we know so little about the universe that we might as well know nothing about the universe. Um, but we know we are part of it. And we do not know what it means, uh, but nonetheless we can say firmly, I know there is a universe and that I am part of it. So there are all kinds of ways in which this paradox uh, comes to be. The second claim implied by this figural understanding of churches becoming the church as the bride has to do with the term future. What do we mean by the term future? Is it a future apl that applied to the church in the same way that we apply the term future to the nation of Syria or Belgium? If we're going to say that the church can't be from Syria, I mean, uh, figure that one out, but is more elusive yet as a referent than is Syria today, and in a historical sense I think we have to, then our notion of the future applied to it will be similarly problematic. And the problem is well known. Biblical scholars and theologians have come up with all kinds of ways to talk about this funniness of talking about the future. Eschatology. Realize eschatology. Already, but not yet. They can try to speak of dispensations, or as we noted earlier, sacramental time and so on. Most especially they can argue, as they should, about the concept of the end. The book of Revelation is a classic case of debate over the nature of temporality as applied to the prophetic utterances of the church. Is the future tied to the end that must quickly come to pass, 
as the book states its contents in its first verse, taken sequentially as a chronology of the unfolding events that come to temporal conclusion with the descent of the heavenly Jerusalem in chapter 22, Revelation is actually very hard to put together on those terms. Before and afters line up with great difficulty, and even the earliest commentators of the book, like Victorinus, recognize this. It's very hard to plot out the book of Revelation in a coherent fashion, in a sequential chronological way. So I doubt we can expect agreement on these matters. Instead, I think we should approach this question, the question of time in the church and her future and her end, in the same way we approach the question of the referent of the word church. That is to say, we should approach it figuratively. Thus, the future itself is a figure. Futurity is a figure. It's a scriptural figure. Indeed, it's a range of scriptural figures. Just as the end is a figure, not an absolute moment in human terms. The ordering of time turns out to be itself a figural referent drawn according to scriptural forms. We can ask the question, what will I become? The figural possibilities are numerous. Jacob, Hannah, Delilah, uh, whoever, Hezekiah. Uh, uh, what tomorrow will be ours? Uh, is, it, is it Jerusalem applied to the church? Is it Tyre? Is it Egypt? And if it's Jerusalem, whose Jerusalem is it? Is it Hezekiah's? Is it Zedekiah's? Is it Solomon's Jerusalem? Is it Herod's Jerusalem? The not yet of the church is given in the midst of these figures, and our discernment of them is given in our prayers, and in our seeking, uh, and in our obedience. Now, I realize this is a very peculiar way to look at history. It has little to do with political time, or economic time, or medical time or any other, f other forms of arranging, arranging experience that generally stand outside of the scriptural faith. But it's actually one that is rooted, I believe, in much of the churches and Jewish Israel's experience. The process of temporal movement, the fulfillment of that movement, the shape of that movement, and so on, these are all themselves given to us as figures in the scripture themselves. And we experience them insofar as these figures become ours in desire, or resistance. God speaks the, the scriptures, and as we hear it, time flows to us from its words. The church has a future. The church has an end. Then, insofar as the church is figured as Israel, for example, or as the body of Christ, or as the bride, but she doesn't have any other future besides that. Now, we'll wrap up here. The most difficult conclusion I think here for our culture's ears to hear, as well as our own overly enculturated churches, is this. If the church and her time are figurally given, then there is no future of the church that is properly correlated to some otherwise experienced future. That is to say the future of the United States or Canada or Africa or climate change. We cannot correlate the future of the church to the history of nations, of worlds, of evolution, or any of these things. And that is why, to go back to my opening remarks, the deployment of personal experience uh, and experiential reasoning and sociological statistics can offer little that is useful for ecclesial futurology, except that as, it, as it drives us to try to discern it. Um, what's the practical payoff for such a figural ecclesiology? And here's my last brief section. In many ways, such a way of looking at the church does not alter our fundamental practices. What we are talking about is churches becoming the bride. And that movement is a movement which has to do with change, and that change has to do with purification. That is the story of the church. The church will be purified finally before God. And all the things that we associate with that happen. Uh, but if you try to map that on to how we live as a church, that doesn't say that the way we live as a church looks that different than the way it looks now in terms of our practices, although it may encourage us to reconsider those practices in particular directions. In many ways, our practices are the same. The search for faithful life and witness remains the same. 
concerns about teaching, dealing with conflict and perceived error, bettering the shape of ministry, all these are things that still remain in place. None of these normal duties is subverted by a figural outlook regarding the church's life. What, after all, is the nature of change for the church uh, or the history of the church? As Paul points to spotlessness or, or revelation, to blamelessness and purity and so on, these are all the terms that are wrapped up in just those sorts of things associated with the Spirit's work that Philip was talking about this morning and that others have talked about. In Galatians 5, it's the, it's the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, self-control, patience, meekness, peace, joy, love. You see, time in her ravages, which is the scope of the transformation of churches into the bride, changes those who have been called into and amongst the chosen so that they bear fruit. That's what happens in time. We are changed in just this way. It's striking how few are the tempestuous verses of end time conflict within the scripture when compared to most of the plodding accounts of obedience, often difficult, maybe failing, in everyday matters of life and death together. These are the places where the strange realities of the past and the future make their appearance. But just here, normal life of the church and of obedience and so on. So and as I say, I take that this is in part what Philip Turner has been pressing in his recent work. Ethics is not primarily about problem solving. How are we going to get the church to this special place it's supposed to be so that it, it solves whatever problems it has uh, on, the, on the plane of the grandiose canvas of Revelation? Rather, that canvas and all of its thrilling grandeur is actually describing the life of the Christian church as her members are changed together in mutual faithfulness. In all these areas, of course, there are pragmatic decisions and outcomes that have to be made, and these have to do with gauging probabilities and prudentialities, and so we have a sense of the future. That is true. Viewing the future figuratively doesn't alter the scope of planning. Uh, we still have to deal with that. It's a question of how we do our planning. I'm certain that a figural outlook must necessarily lead us to place less weight on the effective outcome of our normal ecclesial activities and far more weight on how those activities actually purify our souls together. This, I believe, is liberation to faithfulness. That's what proper ecclesial futurology should do. It should liberate us to be more obedient and faithful than whatever worries we might have about this or that because it is driven by a joyful embrace of providential mystery rather than by enslavement to the appearances of temporal goods. This is how most people understand the ordering of the future. Amongst the best ecclesial futurologists because of their figural sensibilities were 19th century America's Christian rural poor, both African American and white. One could call them the humiliated Davids, if you will, in their bard-like devotions of songwriting and worship. The future, as they saw, was simply a call that the present be manifested in the very forms of God's scriptures. To give one example, you know the, 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 the spiritual song, Mary's a-weeping. Is there anybody here a-weeping like Mary? Call on my Jesus and he'll draw nigh. Is there anybody here like Peter, a sink? Call on my Jesus and he'll draw nigh. Is there anybody here like jailers a trembling? Is there anybody here like Thomas a doubting? Call on my Jesus and he'll draw nigh. Glory, 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 glory be to God on high. That is a figural ecclesiology looking at the future in the form of a way of discerning one's life in the church together. As discernment, ministry, and decision making move into this unveiling of one's temporal location, in and as the church, trembling Mary, weeping Mary, trembling jailer, doubting Thomas, the calling out to Jesus, Maranatha, as Revelation ends, transforms us into the bride that he embraces. So it's a different kind of planning for the future that this kind of figural uh, Christian and figural church is engaged in. Uh, I've been involved in a lot of big picture ecclesial charting of the waters, diocesan committees and planning and national strategizing and international covenant designing and ecumenical groups at the Vatican and so on. And, and you see, and all, it's all a wonderful thing to do. It's all worthwhile. 
But none of this represents the purifying future of the church. Such gestures are a part of that future only as they shape our hearts, purge our, our enmities, straighten our desires, open our spirits, humble our demands, join our loves, direct our hopes, strengthen our steadfastness. You can go on. The figure of the bride mold our minds and souls into the form of Jesus Christ. And that time is any time. At least as historians count it, that time is this time, as futurologists measure it. And that place is this place, as ge geographers map it. For insofar as the book of truth, as Daniel puts it, is opened, as indeed the scriptures are made known to us, the times of past and future are given as our own. My own ecclesiolog ecclesiological commitments to staying put in a given church as one awaits the divine stripping out of our divisions and disobediences is bound up, you see, with just such an understanding. My future is here. Not here just because it's today, but because this is the place where what future means for the church is actually taking place. Now, I'm not sanguine, and I'll bring this to an end, about the fate of Anglicanism in North America, for instance. But what would optimism mean in the case of such an ecclesial entity as Anglicanism anyway? If one were to ask, what is the future of the Catholic Church, or of the Baptist churches, or of Anglicanism, one could only but rightly say that it is for them or it to be transformed in the context of whatever set of seemingly tribulational events of any kind take place into the forms of Christ's life and witness so as to constitute the life of the Spirit that Paul describes. And that transformation, as somebody mentioned, comes in whittling down and building up and tearing down and recreating, all of that. That is, the future of the church lies in just such a transformation of her churches, just such as these. Right now, Anglicanism in North America is being stripped apart. Who knows of what to what end? That's a figural comment. It's not a sociological comment, though they might overlap. But our faithfulness as Anglicans lies in living through this with faith. So that in the end, there is one bride of such a form and figure, and this bride is then taken by Christ in a single act of grace and made the body of Christ in a nuptial embrace. It might mean the disappearance of this or that church, uh, of Protestantism, of Pentecostalism, of Catholicism. Why not? Certainly, these nomenclatures do not exist as scriptural figures in themselves. The Song of the Lamb in Revelation 7 is sung by the gathering of distinctions, every nation, kindred, people, and tongue. And each bears the name of Christ, we're told. They don't bear the name of Protestant or of Evangelical or Catholic. We all know this. This is 1 Corinthians 1 and 2 and so on. On the other hand, these distinctions are not necessarily done away with. The Song of the Lamb is the same song that everybody is singing, but in different languages. There are many peoples. Babel isn't somehow uh, erased. It's resolved. When they sing and pray before the Lamb, maybe Anglicans will use the, the BCP. <laughs> Why not? But if they do, here's the point, they will not know it. <laughs> nor will they care in the least that this is what they are doing. Nor will anybody else, for that matter. For they will only be praising the Lamb in whatever way they do it. They will be present before Christ, not as Catholic or Orthodox or Anglican, but as the nations. They will be present as Philistia, as Tyre, as Ethiopia. That's the figural promise. The Anglican will be surprised to bear the appearance of a converted Philistine. The Lutheran to appear as a humbled Scythian, and so on. You might try to find the most contradictory figures you can to present ecclesial self-identities. I'm not sure what that would mean, but it would be worth our time to look at the fate of the nations you see in this light, because it's the same as our future with respect to our ecclesial groups. If we know this future, we will seek to order our lives, I would guess, in very specific and in some cases quite novel ways. The future ain't what it used to be, because the future as a humanly ordered conceptual construct was never anything we could articulate as real in the first place. We have been looking in the wrong place for the future. 
But perhaps the church's future is also precisely what it used to be and always has been. For the church's future is simply a way of talking about what it means to be a human creature in Christ as Christ takes us to himself with one another. And we shall discover our futures as in Jesus' urging we search the scriptures and pray that in them we hear his voice and see his form.